It's Game Boy World, and this at last is the Game Boy. So we've looked at the Game Boy's launch lineup in its first couple of months of releases, seven games in all. They've ranged from meh to remarkable, but even the least impressive games have their place in history. After all, at the time of Game Boy's debut, there literally was nothing else like it for sale in the world. Now that we've reached August 1989 and the American launch of the system, we should look at the hardware itself. But first, let's talk about what came before Game Boy. The idea of portable gaming certainly didn't come into existence from nowhere the day Game Boy launched. Various toy companies have been dabbling in the concept since the 1970s. In fact, it's kind of hard to say what the first handheld games were. It makes sense that early portable systems hailed from toy makers because there's a pretty clear line of continuity from mechanical or gravity powered toys to Game Boy. Nintendo itself had a lengthy history with handheld amusements, many of which were designed by the man responsible for the system, Gunpei Yokoi. So when you look back at one of those simple toys where you try to shoot ball bearings into a hole or whatever, you're looking at the blueprint for Game Boy. Eventually, the advent of inexpensive, compact electronic components allowed manufacturers to cram LED lights into them, then simple circuits and LCD art, then legit computer processors, like the Game Boy CPU, which was based on the processors that powered computers in the late 1970s and early 80s. Impressive, right? Well, uh, no, not really. In terms of technology, Game Boy was the furthest thing from impressive, even in 1989. The concept itself wasn't that original. For instance, Milton Bradley had produced the first ever LCD portable that ran on interchangeable cartridges all the way back in 1979, a full decade before Game Boy's launch. The Microvision was agonizingly primitive and tremendously expensive, but it proved the concept was sound. Hardly anyone else tinkered with the concept again for nearly a decade though, perhaps because the Game & Watch approach of dedicated LCD handhelds that were nearly as cheap as a game cartridge on its own worked so well. The next cartridge-based handheld to enter series production also came from a Western company, Epix, although their handy didn't see the light of day for nearly three years after its inception when Atari bought it up and marketed it as Lynx. Nintendo may have begun developing Game Boy after Handy kicked off the Lynx project, but the Game Boy ended up beating the other system to retail by a matter of months. Still, the close release of the two systems makes for a telling study in purpose and philosophy. Game Boy used a puny processor and a frankly terrible screen, but those features worked to its advantage, allowing Nintendo to offer it for less than half the price of the Lynx and being relatively gentle on batteries. Sega's Game Gear would improve on Lynx's tech, but it too would fall afoul of both its upfront and its long-term costs. Nintendo has been a major force in the video games industry almost since the beginning, but as we saw last week at E3, by and large it's never really competed on the same terms as other game makers. The company's history as a toy and gadget maker continues to shape its approach to hardware design, sometimes for the better, sometimes for worse. In the case of Game Boy though, this mindset definitely worked for the best. Now if you look at Game Boy as a game system, its modest power and inferior LCD screen seem like sheer folly. Taken as a successor to Nintendo's long line of kid-sized gizmos and amusements though, it makes perfect sense. And of course, the man responsible for Game Boy's hardware design, Gunpei Yokoi, had been the mastermind of countless Nintendo doodads and whatchamacallits dating back to the 1960s. In fact, former Nintendo Corporation Limited president Hiroshi Yamauchi discovered Yokoi as he found the man messing around with a toy-like device of his own design to kill downtime while he was working on Nintendo's assembly line. Impressed, Yamauchi promptly commissioned Yokoi to turn this toy into an actual product. He did, and it became one of Nintendo's first commercial hits, the Ultra Hand. In the years that followed, Yokoi spearheaded the design of dozens of toys, many of which worked as compact electromechanical renditions of arcade amusements. Another major hit for Yokoi came in the form of the Love Tester, a simple toy that measured the electrochemical voltage between two people to predict their romantic compatibility. Over time, Nintendo's toy line incorporated more and more electronic elements, which made their mid-70s entree into dedicated single-title game consoles a natural one. And with their flag planted in the soil of the embryonic games industry, Nintendo's Game & Watch seemed a similarly natural progression tiny portable gadgets that repurposed adult-oriented technology, in this case LCD wristwatches, for the sake of kids. And adults too, but mostly kids. The adult world is designed to keep us moving, and while this may make us more efficient, it's not exactly a party. Luckily, technology has produced a cure. 
It's called a Game Boy, the personal game playing system from Nintendo with lots of sports. It's this history that created the primal stew that gave rise to Game Boy. It could change your outlook. I'm sorry, sir, your flight's been delayed. But life didn't come into being until it was jolted by the bolt of lightning that was Sony's Walkman. One of the most revolutionary electronic devices ever made, the Walkman made Hi-Fi Audio Portable, packing the ability to play radio and cassette tapes into a compact, battery-powered device that output music through a pair of headphones. That was the Walkman's fundamental revolution. It exploded the concept of personal electronics into the mainstream. Sony created a self-contained gadget designed for a single person, compromising top-of-the-line sound quality for the sake of convenience and portability. This philosophy would influence portable hardware design for decades to come. Nintendo, for their part, wasn't even shy about borrowing Sony's incredible idea. Game Boy reads as an obvious riff on Walkman, adopting the English language construction of the cassette player's name while also speaking to its purpose that is, playing video games, and its target audience, that is, boys. Plus, the name Game Boy made it clear that the handheld was meant to be the junior counterpart to the NES. The serious game experience was still to be found on the console, while the handheld offered a less completely formed take. Game Boy turned NES-era game design into a solitary pursuit. But of course, Nintendo's love of play and socialization still found a place in the system, despite its being designed for a single player to hold and play at intimate range. While Game Boy excelled at reproducing NES-like single-player experiences, the first year alone would bring players Super Mario, Castlevania, and Final Fantasy spin-offs, the system could also connect to other Game Boys through its Link Cable feature. The Link Cable allowed as many as 32 players to daisy-chain their systems together, at least in theory, in practice all but a handful of multiplayer games limited themselves to two-person experiences. And by no means was this solely a Nintendo innovation. After all, Atari's Lynx included a similar feature, the Comlynx, which enabled similar head-to-head -head play options. But Link Cable's presence demonstrated Nintendo's priorities. After all, Lynx was meant to be the Cadillac of portable game systems, a massive luxury device with all the bells and whistles. Game Boy was a K-car, compact and inexpensive, its feature set stripped to the bare minimum. Nintendo cut every corner they could, but the ability to socialize still made the final cut. Instead, the system's compromises affected not so much the basic feature set as the quality of those features. The system's processor was a variant on the humble Zilog Z80, an 8-bit derivative of the legendary 8080 processor that helped power the PC revolution of the 70s. Ten years prior to Game Boy, the Z80 was a giant. By 1989, however, it seemed a primitive pipsqueak next to the likes of Motorola's 68000, which had powered the Macintosh in 1984 and now ticked away beneath the hood of Sega's Genesis. By a similar token, Game Boy's screen was barely adequate. Capable of a mere four shades of grayscale, it couldn't even provide that trait effectively. Its dull greenish cast set the white color value to a putrid shade reminiscent of an unpleasant diaper accident, and the darker tones weren't much better. Even with a contrast dial cranked up, its facsimile of black was closer in tone and value to rotting asparagus. Like most consumer-oriented LCDs of the day, the Game Boy screen employed a passive matrix display. This resulted in a severe motion blur that affected moving objects as the screen slowly redrew graphics. For simple single-screen affairs, like puzzle games and old-school arcade hits, this was hardly detrimental. But for anything that scrolled, such as platformers and shooters, Game Boy's visuals quickly degenerated into a smeary mess. Every moving object was trailed by a blurry afterimage as once darkened pixels faded to so-called white. This severely undermined the playability of many games, especially the NES caliber experiences developers sought to make portable. And yet despite these individual failings, the system simply couldn't fail. Its particular design flaws were more than offset by all the advantages Yokoi built into the system. Its rugged, compact design definitely spoke to the work of an experienced toy designer, one familiar with the utter lack of care with which children treat their playthings. The Game Boy hardware could withstand any number of offenses, impacts, scratches, even fire, and keep ticking away. Crack the screen and you could still make out the graphics running away happily around the bleeding LCD cells. Run it through the washing machine and it would kick back to life a few days later when its innards had dried out again. The Game Boy was like the Terminator, invincible, unstoppable, relentless in its mission to entertain children. Of course, Yokoi also had another advantage working in his favor, Nintendo's utter dominance of two-thirds of the global video games industry. The simple fact that the people behind Mario had produced a handheld system, well, that was good for a few million sales alone. A few years after Game Boy's launch, the Super NES would draw fire for making the NES obsolete and mooting kids' expensive 8-bit libraries. 
But there was no such concern for the Game Boy. It was a wholly unique device from the NES, despite its obvious kinship. More primitive and limited, it was also one used in a totally different fashion. Even if Lynx had beaten Game Boy to market, Atari had very little in the way of must-play games on day one. Nintendo, on the other hand, delivered not only a legitimate, if miniaturized and somewhat weird, Super Mario game, but also the majestic Tetris as well. And within a matter of months, it brought the full fury of Nintendo third-party partners to bear on the market as well. Atari couldn't begin to compete, not in 1989. US game developers were still struggling to catch up in the console space, having shifted to personal computers and arcades after the early 80s crash that had been precipitated by Atari in the first place. No, consoles were a playground dominated by the Japanese, and Japanese developers weren't going to partner with Atari when Nintendo had its own homegrown handheld option available to them. After all, despite Nintendo's reputation for unfavorable licensing terms, the Famicom and NES had made many publishers very, very rich, and the Game Boy represented the most obvious opportunity for extending that filthy lucre into a new medium. The Game Boy looked like easy money even in the midst of Japan's 80s economic boom, a time when the yen practically minted itself. The system had a guaranteed global reach of millions. Its humble hardware was easy and cheap to develop for. The Z80 processor was an industry standard, well documented and familiar to any programmer with his salt. Hardware was cheap, software was cheap too, and Nintendo already had an amazing global distribution system in place. For developers who already had extensive experience in NES game design, its little cousin must have been a total no-brainer. Really, the biggest drawback to Game Boy, besides its harrowing technological limitations, was the fact that every game had to stand up against Nintendo's own first-party projects. It may not have been much to look at, but between its familiar NES-style control setup and the link cable, the Game Boy could offer a reasonable simulation of NES play experiences. Enough to satisfy kids, certainly, and appealing in its own way to adults as well. Puzzle and parlor games made a better fit for Game Boy than kid-friendly mascot action games. Despite its juvenile moniker, the system sunk its hooks into grown-ups in short order as well. Of course, the no-brainer business appeal of Game Boy also worked against the system, Thanks to the low barriers of entry to development, the machine was quickly inundated by decidedly less than exceptional wares. The early years of the Game Boy library were flooded by repetitive puzzle games. Shopping for Game Boy software meant slogging through a minefield of licensed crap, and a preponderance of 2-bit Pokemon clones made the system's later years similarly fatiguing. Things were even worse in Japan, where dozens of indistinguishable horse racing simulators, pachinko games, and mahjong titles choked the release lists. American gamers missed out on a few gems over the years, but we also dodged enough bullets to belt feed an M20. These combined factors, low cost, adequate technology, kid-friendly design, an extensive and varied library, and tons of third-party support made Game Boy an unrivaled success. The competition produced some impressive rivals over the years, including Sega's powerful Game Gear, which literally was an upgraded portable master system, and the Turbo Express from NAC, which played actual TurboGrafx-16 games. Yet none of them hit on all the same success points as Nintendo, and none of them came close to selling anywhere near as many units as Game Boy. Ultimately, Nintendo came away the clear victor in handheld gaming, though that too exacted a certain toll as well. Lacking true competition, Nintendo drifted along after a while and ceased to innovate. Instead of producing a Game Boy follow-up after seven years, they instead produced a more energy-efficient model with a better screen. Meanwhile, Yokoi focused his efforts on the tragic Virtual Boy, another toy-inspired self-contained gaming system, but one that lacked the smart, no-frills appeal of Game Boy. Nintendo's salvation from that brush with disaster actually came from Game Boy itself when Nintendo gave the system its second wind in the mid-90s. With the rest of the industry and the press, too focused on the heated 32-bit console wars to care about handhelds, Game Boy flew beneath the radar until Pokemon became too big to ignore. That phenomenon caught everyone except Nintendo flat-footed, and Game Boy mopped up. In fact, Pokemon's success gave Nintendo the freedom to shelve the Game Boy's direct successor, the 32-bit Project Atlantis, for five years and continue to rake in the easy money with the aged Game Boy hardware. Rather than take handheld gaming into the next generation in a prompt fashion, Nintendo chose instead to follow up Game Boy with the Game Boy Color, an incremental upgrade to the old black and white system. Less a new generation than an enhancement, Game Boy Color offered smooth intercompatibility with its predecessor's library, with a number of cartridges offering dual support for both platforms. As a result, Game Boy ultimately remained a viable platform for more than a decade. Its final release, the dual-compatible One Piece Maboroshi no Grand Line Bokenki, launched in Japan on June 28, 2002, more than 13 years after the system's April 21, 1989 debut, and more than a year after the arrival of its second successor, Game Boy Advance. 
Meanwhile, Game Boy Color stuck around for more than a year after that. The licensed utility app Doraemon Study Boy, Kanji Yome Kaki Master, launched on July 18th, 2003. While not exactly the most exciting finale to a platform that lived well beyond any reasonable estimates of its natural life, in a way, that's kind of fitting. Underwhelming and licensed content, those were the Game Boy's bread and butter, and the system's unexciting competence kept the tills ringing for years after its superior competitors were long since dead and buried. In the tortoise and hare race that was console gaming, slow and underwhelming ultimately won the race for Nintendo. Maybe it's fitting that that screen was so darn green. For more tales of Game Boy's life, visit GameBoyWorld.com.